Good morning, everyone. Um, can I give you all a very warm welcome to the 11th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. We have received apologies from Gordon McD McDonald this morning, and we have Gil Patterson as substitute for Mr. McDonald. Um, apologies have also received from Tavish Scott, who may well join us later in the morning. Um, and also, um, we've heard that Rona Mackay is, is coming, but is running late due to traffic this morning. Um, agenda item one is a decision to take business in private. Are members content to take agenda item three in private? Thank you. Agenda item two this morning is on uh, a session on STEM uh, to inform the remit of the committee's future inquiry on this topic. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting this morning, Lorna Hay, uh, te teacher in Chukar Primary School. Pachuca, <laughs> thank you. Uh, professor Ian Hunter, uh, Research Professor of Molecular Microbiology at the University of Strathclyde. Dr Fiona McNeil, Associate Professor of Computer Science at Heriot Watt University and representing the Learner Societies Group of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, Tony Scullion, who's a Computing Science Teacher in St Kentigern's Academy. Liz Turner, Head of Corporate Responsibility at the BT Group. And Professor Ian Wall, former chair of the Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics Education Committee, STEMEC. And Talat Jakub, director of Equate Scotland. Um, I'm not going to ask the committee members individually to introduce themselves. So um, what I'd like to do is just have a very brief introduction from um, our guests this morning. Um, just a brief outline of their interest in this area. And I think I'll go round the right hand side and uh, invite Talat to, okay, to go first. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me along to speak today. Um, so Equate Scotland is the national expert on women's participation in science, technology, engineering, mathematics and the built environment. Um, so naturally my scope within this and the, the interest is about uh, gender inequality uh, in, within classrooms, within universities and colleges and in industry as well. Uh, the participation of women across STEM has been stubborn, stubbornly low and in some cases is decreasing, particularly in computing um, science. Um, so from my perspective, it is about what we are doing to tackle both societal inequality, stereotypes, but also what we are doing um, across the education pipeline to um, make multiple interventions. Um, so I will be probably focusing upon right across. Um, our work at Equate Scotland is 16 plus, so from apprenticeships onwards, uh, but we do a lot of partnership work with those who are working in schools. Thank you. Um, Professor Hunter? So, good morning. Uh, I'm a professional scientist. I'm an academic. I have worked in industry. Uh, I'm a member of Scottish Science Advisory Council. Um, when all of you were elected in 2016, all of your manifestos talked about STEM and, in fact, some of the issues that Talat has, has just talked about. So, subsequent to that, and indeed with, with, with the SNP lead forming the government, um, the, um, we'll probably talk about it, the, there was a framework developed, uh, a strategy for STEM implementation by Scottish Government. With the Chief Scientific Advisor Scotland, Professor Sheila Rowan, I co-chaired the external reference group that helped on the advice on that. Uh, subsequent to that, um, there's an implementation group which essentially involves, um, to be frank, employees of Scottish Government in delivering the, uh, the strategy, and uh, I now co-chair the external advisory group uh, reporting to the Minister um, with Sheila Rowan um, on this. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Wall. Good morning. Uh, I've chaired two committees, in fact, first of all SEAG um, and subsequently STEMEC, both of which write long and detailed reports fully evidenced for the Scottish Government, uh, the latter one, the STEMEC report. Uh, was said to be the basis of the science strategy for uh, learning and teaching, although a, a good chunk of what we had in it didn't really appear. Um, subsequent to that, so that's one area. Uh, just touching on, I'm also a fellow of the RSE and a member of the Education Committee, and recently we published a revised version of our Tapping All the Talents, which is about the role of women in science and technology. And thirdly, one of the key strands of work coming out of um, the SEAC and the STEMIC report was in interdisciplinary learning, 
which I want to emphasise is not solely a STEM issue, it's about education in general, it involves the humanities and every discipline you can think of. Nevertheless, um, it often arises in STEM because people get even more siloed than normal in, say, chemistry than they do in English literature, which is a slightly amorphous boundaries. Um, so these these three things, uh, ones of, but the first two, tapping all our talents and the reports, I think the issue is in general that although there's always new research and new ideas and so on, the question is implementation, and this is this is not one of those reports that has gathered dust on the shelf, but it's not one of those reports or series of reports that is being implemented with the vigour and conviction that's required. And it would seem to me that a parliamentary committee is one of the ways in which you know can be tested if governments of any stripe are delivering what uh, they need to do to, be, to deliver good science and technology education. On the IDL, this of course is the one of the four contexts for the curriculum for excellence, so it's one of the fundamental building blocks. Um, and what we like to think, take that analogy of the, the foundation uh, and then upon that you build the, the pillars of the disciplines and it is the lintels, of course, the across discipline. It's only once you have the lintels, you don't have something. Well, you can see an example at Stonehenge where part of it's fallen down, but part of it's still standing. Which bits are standing? The ones with the lintels. So uh, this is a key area for development. We had a major conference last month, which was, uh, sorry, eight, six weeks ago. It's very, very successful. One of the more successful conferences around education in Scotland. And because, of course, it united everybody, universities, colleges, schools, primary, um, uh, officers involved in the administration of education and so on. So I'm hoping this is an area that the committee will pay particular attention to in the coming period. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Hay. Hello, um, I'm a primary school teacher in Fife um, with a particular interest in engineering. That's where my, my passion lies. Last year I did um, a postgraduate certificate in engineering STEM learning. Um, during that time, as part of my initial research, I went into industry and I interviewed 33 engineers about their career inspiration and also about something called engineering habits of mind, which was a term derived by Bill Lucas in Thinking Like an Engineer to talk about the characteristic ways that engineers think and act. Um, and I've kind of built my um, kind of pedagogy around that. We've had a big push in our school to really see the, the importance of early intervention in terms of engineering. We know the statistics are there to say that the, the rate at which the industry is progressing, we're simply not going to have the, 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 the people to, to fill those roles. Um, and we know that people are not choosing these options at high school, particularly young females. Um, and there's a lot of research, the Aspires research said that if children are not engaged in STEM by age 10, they're not going to make those subject choices. So it's my belief that if there is an inquiry into STEM, then we need to be targeting um, primary education because that's where we need to um, build the engagement. And my experience is that um, through my research that by engaging children in engineering activities, then they are increasing um, the likelihood that they are then going to choose these subjects later. Um, in fact, there was, there was some research by Kawana et al. They investigated why the UK has the lowest proportion of female engineers in the EU, and they <coughs> said that creating an enjoyment of engineering might be as significant as attainment in terms of the likelihood of a child choosing those subjects. So that's kind of where I'm coming from, really focusing in on, on the engineering aspect of it. It's not something I had access to when I was at primary school. Um, so I think that's where we need to um, perhaps focus something. And also there's issues which we might come on to discuss about teacher confidence or lack thereof. How do we develop um, effective CPD because it's long term um, engagement in C CPD that will make a difference to learners. Um, and obviously there's issues through um, the, the gender bias and, and things like that as well that I think need to kind of come into that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Turner. Hi, good morning. I should start by saying I'm neither a teacher nor a scientist. Um, I head up BT's corporate responsibility programme, um, but a big <coughs> area that we concentrate a lot of investment and activity in is around digital skills. 
um, and employability skills generally. Um, BT employs around 7,900 people in Scotland, so we employ one in every eight people that are in the IT and communications sector in Scotland. Um, so obviously as a business, it's important to us that the, the pipeline of, of talent um, is coming through. But there's a wider issue for me, and my area of expertise is really around um, how as a business we can support um, education, uh, government and other partners to help deliver the digital skills that are needed for both the jobs of the future but also the kind of life skills if we take outside the, the, the mainstream schooling system. It's also around the um, digital inclusion, how we get people who are not currently online to get the, sk the skills and the confidence to get online. Um, within school there are a number of programmes that we've been very involved in Barefoot is one which I think is probably particularly relevant for discussions today and just backing up what other people said it's very much about engaging people at a young age, pupils at a young age at primary level um, in particular recognising that these skills are going to be required whatever type of work mm. they go to um, into the future and also for general life skills as well um, we've also been working with young engineers and science clubs for over 20 years and we also support the Digital Extra Fund um, so those are a couple of initiatives that we've kind of been very involved in for a very long time. And lastly, just to mention, um, for us, there is an issue around female engagement as well. Again, reiterating what other people have said, we're finding it really difficult, much as we want to get more females into uh, engineering apprenticeships and graduate schemes. They're just not there in the volume that we need them. Um, so that's an area that we'd like to, to see addressed as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. O'Neill? Thank you. Um, so I'm representing the Learned Society group, um, which is looking into STEM education. I'm a member of the uh, British Computer Society, um, which is who I represent on the LSG. So we meet quarterly at the RSE and we talk about all kinds of issues around STEM education in Scotland. Um, and it includes all the Learned Society's Institute of Physics, the Royal Society of Chemistry and Biology, Scottish Mathematical Council and, and so on. Um, and we prepare various submissions for the government um, from time to time. The most recent one was uh, last month we did one on subject choice at high school and how that's impacting on, on the number of children and young people studying STEM. So uh, I, I think we can sort of separate the, 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 the things we mostly discuss into two main areas. One is the issue of teaching, which is a huge issue. There's massive shortage of, of STEM teachers. As a computer scientist, I'm really aware of this. There's very, very large numbers and increasing numbers of high schools in Scotland with no computing staff at all, where, where young people just can't take those qualifications. But it's not just the computing. It's, it's, it's pretty bad in maths. It's bad in chemistry. It's bad in physics. This is a huge issue. Um, and there's also issues with, with keeping teachers in the post once they're, uh, they're assigned. And in fact, even it seems with keeping uh, teacher trainers in the training course and to go on to become teachers there's a big drop off there um, there are we're concerned about how much stem there is in primary schools and whether primary teachers have the right sort of preparation and background to be encouraging young people in primary schools to to be interested in stem and whether they're getting the right kind of support in their career long professional development to to support the children like that um, and the other side of things is how we encourage young people to take STEM subjects. So the number of young people taking STEM subjects in high school is going down. Over the last five years, we've seen the number of hires overall increase, but the number of STEM hires is going down. And it's going down particularly in some subjects, notably computing. Um, but it's a problem for, for most of the STEM subjects. Uh, we think that the fact that the, they have fewer choices now is an issue of how many people take STEM and also the university STEM courses that require multiple STEM qualifications. If you're only taking six Nat Fives, that's a, that's a problem. And of course, the gender imbalance is, is keeping a lot of people away from STEM subjects. And outside my work with the LSG, I've also done a lot of work with outreach with young people, but also parents about how we enthuse young people about science and engineering and make them feel this is exciting and something that they can see themselves engaged in. And I also do a lot of work with gender issues. I was on the Tapping All Our Talents board with Talent. And I was um, particularly looking within that into what's going on in the schools and how, how and not just schools, but also um, early years and how we're steering girls away from STEM and what we can do about that. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, finally, Miss Scullion. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Tony Scullion. I am a computing science teacher from West Lothian. Um, again, following up from what Tally and Fiona have both said, there is 
a massive lack of females who take computing science and the, the figures are absolutely shocking. Um, and so I have made it my absolute mission to close this gender gap. Um, so I'm trying to do that by, um, as well as being a computing science teacher and trying in my classroom, I have actually founded my own charity called Dress Codes and um, just do that kind of on the side. But I've managed to gain funding from JP Morgan, which is fantastic. And it's really helped me um, begin to roll it out across the country. But also it's trying to bridge the gap between industry as well um, between industry and education so I've had quite a lot of success with that with particularly three of my senior girls called the Turing testers so recently they um, partnered with the data lab and we ran the first international women in data science event of their data fest and it was all done by these three amazing girls so it's just to really try and empower girls and show them that you know connecting with industry and giving them that support that they really can make a difference so no biggie but yeah I'm going to close that gender gap. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, th thank you very much. That's all, all really helpful. Um, I'm really just going um, to, we expect to be quite a free flowing and, um, uh, discussion. So if you can indicate to myself or the clerks if you do want to come in on a particular subject. But um, I'm going to go to the members. Does anyone want to have an opening question? Miss Mackay? Yeah. Yeah, just on the, the gender thing, what, what do you think the barriers are to that? Is there anything obvious that makes you think that, you know, girls won't, won't enter these, go for these subjects? Um, I'm going to unveil a big secret for my dress code. <laughs> um, but everything we do in my, um, so it's a dress code club, but then we'd also have um, hackathons in industry. But the big secret is everything I do, and that is the exact same thing that I do with boys in my classroom. <laughs> like, I don't think you'd need to tailor it to be more girly or anything. I don't believe that at all. And I know if we speak to a lot of my um, first year girls, they come up and, and you speak to the seniors, they, they have no idea about the gender gap. So I think it's more um, kind of giving them the space, sort of using particular language. Like, I don't think making a big deal out of it helps, to be honest. Um, give them, them creativity. So all the things that I do in my classroom, as well as dress codes, is... Um, it's really just saying you can make whatever you want and we are there just to facilitate it. But I think a major um, thing that has to change would be like a more modern pedagogy approaches. So, for example, the computing curriculum, I think it's really good. Um, it's all been changed, although it's been very hard. It's, I think it is better. Um, but I think there's, like you had said before, there's lack of um, sort of upskill of teachers I think that needs to happen um, like web design a lot of people still use notepads and that's just not as exciting as other things that are out there so I think but it's time time's the biggie um, teachers need the time to just or someone to create pick up and play resources to go this is amazing it's been tried and tested and works with, with girls so that's what I'm trying to package and dress code and roll it out but it's a really difficult question um, but yeah, role models, creativity is the biggie, I find. Um, working with, with teams, you know, not just by themselves. Because with the club, um, what the, the kind of reason I started that was because we always had a computing club and girls would come along, but then they would stop coming. And when we asked why, they were like, oh, none of my friends come. So now we make it that it's just a girls, it's just a girls club, but it's just the same as what we do with the boys. But it's literally just having the space that they can see more friends come and then they see other girls doing it. And it's like role models, not in industry, but within your own school. A little hard question, but yeah, hopefully that helps. You. No, thank You're you. Welcome. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Lorna, you wanted to come in? Yeah. Coming back to your question, a lot of it to do is with perceptions and um, girls need to be seeing positive female role models within STEM. Um, our kind of journey in our school um, with, with STEM and particularly engineering has gone on for a couple of years now and we always start the year with asking the boys and girls, whatever age they are, please can you draw an engineer? And going back to the very first time we did it, it was an endless list of Bob, Bob the Builder. In the overalls, with the hard hat on, with the tools, um, and that was what was perceived with both boys and girls. You know, two and a half, three years down the line, um, both boys and girls are drawing a mix. We've still got Bob the Builder, but we've also got female engineers. And part of that is because we are exposing the children to um, positive female role models, um, both physically the engineers we get into the school, but also through um, you know, literacy. So there's books like um, Rosie Revere, Engineer, Eggy Peck, Architect, so for the younger ones but also there's a lot of initiatives online 
um, primary engineer who I'm kind of an ambassador for do um, an engagement where children can um, discuss, like it's an online chat with <coughs> engineers and it's a whole host of engineers, male, female, young, older, and also there's an initiative that, that I do with my kids called I'm an engineer, get me out of here. Um, and the children are hugely engaged with this and you know they're seeing young females um, in those positions and that kind of brings you know that that to the forefront I remember when we first um, had a relationship with primary engineer and we were going to be building these cars and we said to the class we've got this, this engineer to come and work with us the door opened and in walks uh, I think it's a 24 year old girl um, really attractive, long hair, and the class literally just went, you know, so it, and it's just turning the, so I think, you know, in, in the media and within education, we need to be providing um, young girls with these positive role models from all aspects of STEM. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, what Tony and, and Lorna have said is absolutely Right, and just to emphasise a couple of things within it, um, the issue around um, women's spaces, girls' spaces, is really important because it is about um, doing something to detract from what is going on elsewhere. So we can do, um, you know, an assembly where we have a role model, but it's actually that sustained activity over time. Single intervention doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. So sustained intervention over a longer period of time requires investment, particularly with young women. Um, but I would emphasise the need for those women's spaces so that they don't feel like they are um, can take a back seat because the boys know more, which is the perception that they have. Um, I would also like to um, emphasise what Tony said about not changing what engineering or computing or chemistry is. It's not to make chemistry into a perfume kit, which I have actually seen and rolled my eyes heavily at. Um, it's not about changing what science is. Science works the way it does, but the only difference is having those spaces where we encourage and develop confidence in, in girls and, and women. The second thing I would talk about is the gender stereotyping that we have. So there's, there's work to be done with parents because the conversations that happen within the classroom aren't enough. It's also what's going on within the home. So it's about raising the literacy around STEM for the general public as well. Um, and lastly, it's about sexism within classrooms. So Girl Guiding Scotland has done a lot about this. We need to tackle language and sexism both whether that's teachers or pupils around what's going on in the classroom. It's one of the reasons that um, Equate Scotland is working with Edinburgh Napier University on the new course for teachers who um, are reskilling, who have been in the computing industry and are reskilling as teachers, going in and doing gender equality training for those teachers so that they feel equipped in the classroom to deal with those things and that they're not reinforcing gender stereotypes in the classroom too. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just, in a way, echoing what other people have said, but I think the fundamental issue here is socialisation. Um, what happened in computing was that in the early years, computing was the women were very strong in computing and doing a lot of the important programming. And then in the 80s, home computers became available and were heavily marketed at boys. And it became something that boys did at home and girls didn't. And that's when we see the rise of the kind of image of a computer scientist as someone who's very nerdy, very male, very specific type of person. And that is ubiquitous in culture. And you look at the things that young people are watching on television and stuff, you see this e echoed again and again and again. And this is what they're always being presented with as what a computer scientist, what a, what a scientist, what, a, what an engineer is. Um, and that's really hard to combat all these things about role models. That's so important. And I really agree with, it's really important with teachers, teachers have a huge role in this, um, but not just computing teachers, but I think what's really important actually is primary schools and especially early years. So in the Tapping All Our Talents review, we, we saw that actually there's a lot of both unconscious and conscious bias going in the schools, right down to to age three, where the girls are being given, here's, here's the girls' toys, here's the boys' toys, and the boys' toys are the, are the STEM-related ones. So I think it's so important that... Um, early as practitioners and primary school teachers have a proper grounding in, in, in these issues and, and are really much more conscious about how they're approaching it. And then also we need to get into the homes, which is really fundamental. That's, that's more difficult, it's, it's really challenging, but it's really important that they're not getting these messages at home, which at the moment I think most children are. I, I'm going to go to Mr Greer for another question. 
Thanks, Convener. Um, it falls on from this point, but I'd like to focus specifically on early years and the first couple of years of uh, primary school for a moment. Uh, we had a conference in here, I think it was about a year, 18 months ago, that Ian Gray and I spoke at with Microsoft. And one of the issues that was highlighted there is the, the huge volume of evidence there is now about um, gender stereotypes in particular being really embedded by the age of seven. And after that, you're essentially undoing damage that's already been done. Um, obviously, that's a huge issue um, at that phase. It's not the, the only issue with delivery of, of STEM education that starts off in early years in primary. And I'd be interested in uh, what folks' impression is of the state of play in early years and primary one to three at the moment in the delivery of STEM education. So we're very well uh, aware of the wider socialisation problems that need tackled. But how equipped do you think most primary teachers and early years practitioners are at present to deliver this? We've heard some really good um, case studies you were talking about best practice earlier on. What's the state of play across most schools that, that you're aware of? Yeah, I think the problem, mm -hmm. I think probably there's, there's pockets of very good work and there's pockets where not a lot has been done. Um, and I think it comes down to teacher confidence and um, certainly the research I looked at and certainly my own setting Again, focusing on the engineering aspect, you know, confidence wasn't high in teaching these subjects. And, you know, the research will tell you that that's detrimental to the delivery of, of STEM education. I was actually quite surprised when I looked at the, um, the, the report of the, the first year of the strategy, and it said that I think 63% of teachers said that they either agreed strongly or strongly agreed that they were confident in delivering those subjects. Now, personally, I feel that that figure is quite high. And I'm wondering, you know, when I, when I asked my staff in my school, I made <coughs> the point of <coughs> separating, because we're talking about science, technology, engineering, and maths. And I think you've got to be very cautious if you are bundling those four things together and saying to a teacher, are you confident with teaching STEM? because you will find that probably the majority are perhaps very confident with maths, mm -hmm. possibly with science, maybe with basic ICT, but the computer science <clears throat> and the engineering, they're not confident at all. So I think, to me, that statistic is perhaps a little bit misleading, and I would suggest that maybe it might be more beneficial to break that down when you're asking teachers and say, Let's look at science, technology, engineering, and maths. What are your confidence exclusively in those four areas? Because to bundle them together, I don't think it's a true reflection of certainly my experience and other experience that I've seen. And it comes down to it's the, the quality of the CPD. You know, I was fortunate that I've done the postgraduate certificate, which when I did it, it was part funded by Skill Scotland. Um, it was delivered delivered and accredited, it was, pri it was a primary engineer initiative, but it's been delivered and accredited with 60 master's credits from the University of Strathclyde. So, you know, that's a, that's a real high quality um, piece of CPD that I feel has impacted hugely on my practice. But I was lucky that that was part funded by Skills Scotland. And I got the professional recognition regardless um, from the GTC but then I was given the choice, if I want those master's credit, then I could pay for those <clears throat> myself to, to Strathclyde University, which I decided to do because it, it was a lot of work and I wasn't coming away with nothing. But I think perhaps that for some teachers, accessing that high quality CBD to change their pedagogy that's better suited for teaching STEM, they're not financially in a position to do that. You know, at, now that course is not funded, so you, people are looking at, teachers are looking at nearly £2,000. You know, and that, that's, quite, that's a lot of money. And at the end of it, in our profession, you know, I had people outside saying, oh, so what do you get for that? Do you get a pay rise? Well, no, I don't get a pay rise. I've done it for me and f to you know, enhance my, my teaching. But I think we need to think about how do we present the CPD to, to deliver and in increase the confidence and also to share the, the good practice that's happening you know, without, we're very, we've been fortunate that, we, that we've created in our school um, a real kind of buzz around STEM and we, you know, had a big STEM showcase event and lots of people came to that and parents came in and engaged with their children 
in engineering on STEM activities and the parents were, were kind of like, wow, you know, I didn't know that this was going on and my child's so enthused by this. Um, what we need to do now is how do we disseminate that into you know, the cluster of schools and, and pass that yeah. kind of knowledge on, I think. Ms. Goldruth just wanted in with a quick supplementary. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you, Peter. It's just a brief supplementary with regard to teacher confidence because um, I was quite taken by, I think, your point, Lorna, and Tony spoke about upskilling the profession. I wonder, going back to initial teacher education, I saw in Professor Wall's submission uh, that it was a recommendation to consider having a, a Nat 5 in science and a higher maths, I think, um, for all primary teachers at initial education level. Would you both agree with that as practitioners, or what's your view? Um, yeah, I think... That is a solution. I think it, it definitely gives the, um, it means that, that teachers are coming in with a kind of certain, certain level of um, skill, I suppose, and confidence with, with teaching science. I think we have to be, be careful that, you know, there's already an issue with recruiting teachers. Yeah. And by raising these goalposts, is that going to then, um, you know, it's not going to help the situation. So as an, alter you know, an alternative to rather look once we've got the teachers in, what can we do once they're on those initial teacher educations? Um, I mean, I, I did the postgrad. I came from a, a previous career. I was a PR consultant. So, you know, my, my training was condensed into a very short time. And there were lectures and practicals in science. But when you think about what we're asking teachers to do, you know, we're we're a jack of all trades, we're a master of none. There's so much, there's so many demands with the curriculum of what we're expected to teach. You know, perhaps we need to look at not create further barriers for people coming into education, but once they're on those courses, how can we retain them and how can we um, improve the quality of, of, the, of their personal learning? I don't know what, what Tony thinks on that. I, I would also agree, like, it's, it's a great idea in principle, but like that, the people getting into the profession is really difficult already. And I do think you can get someone who's got an excellent, like, I know in our school, if someone's very, very good at English and things, they don't tend to do sciences. So I think that might put a barrier towards it. But another solution might be like, like at secondary school, like I'm the computer science expert. So like, if there's more freedom in the curriculum to go down and help in um, primary school. So like Lorna is saying, like upskilling, even if it's CPD or providing more opportunity and ease of access for secondary schools to go secondary school teachers to go to primary schools and, and help them because I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in English or anything else it's really just computing science whereas um, primary school teacher if there's a particular person in my cluster who's struggling with that like I would, I'd be more than willing to but it's just the constraints um, per school so I do think um, getting you know having English and maths and science would be fantastic but would that put more people off I think it might <laughs> um, although it'd be fantastic because it would mean that they've got you know, like a, a full array of um, experience that we'd really roll out in the classroom. Um, but definitely there's kids who do English or do science, but they don't do all three. It's quite rare at our school anyway. That's not like a, a sweeping statement. Um, but yeah, I think more flexibility between primary and secondary would be really good to help that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've got Professor Wall, Professor Hunter both coming in and then I'll come back to you, Dr. Sinclair. Thank you. Dr. McNeil, sorry. Uh, Professor Wall. Just, <coughs> just picking up on that point about um, qualifications, particularly for primary school staff. I mean, the, the first of all, the report didn't say you just introduce that. You do it over a period of time. You wouldn't say to people who are in the last year of school, oh, by the way, you've got to get higher maths or something like that. So it's, you know, it's uh, signposted long before the event and so on, you work towards it. But mathematics is as necessary as English. In, you know, it's, a, it's another language. It is not a, a topic like you'll learn some chemistry and you can do some chemical work or something like that. It's essential to almost any uh, job you do, and in fact, recent developments in English literature rely heavily upon computers and detailed analysis. Um, and if people can't uh, can't use a, a spreadsheet properly and things like that, then they, and understand how they use them properly is really a problem. And say, so, and also just people say, you know, well, it'll put off good teachers. But actually, good teachers have already passed lots of different exams. I mean, it's not like becoming a teacher is something you say, well, look, I'm good, at, I'm good with children. Let me loose in a classroom. It's a skilled professional job in which you need to develop both technical knowledge and pedagogical skills, preferably integrated, not like I'm a good mathematician. Oh, and by the way, I'm a good teacher. Actually, a good teacher in mathematics. So I think that's 
really important, but it, it brings to a wider point I wanted to make, Chair, about what is required is systemic change. So on the question of role models, role models are good, but actually what government and education, science and local authorities should be doing is creating a situation where there are more women engineers coming through, then you don't need role models because actually they're just all around the place and you're not surprised when a woman engineer walks into your classroom. And that, so this is, the role models are all very well and it's something schools and local, you know, it's a local short-term initiative. The fundamental issue for Scottish education is how we shift the game, you know. And that's uh, coming, <coughs> the, um, and, and so when Lorna talked about pockets of excellence, there are, there are more than just pockets. I mean, there are a substantial number of pockets. Some local authorities are better than others. Some schools are better than others and all the rest. The question is, how do we spread that? How do we pass those learnings on? And the role of Education Scotland is really critical here, both in its encouragement and support role, and as an inspectorate role. And if we come back to the question of equalities, if you look as we did at the last five reports in a year, of the inspectors into primary schools, the, um, the question of equalities was dealt with in each case, in well, one case in two sentences and the others in one sentence. And it was clearly a formula, you know? And I'm not saying they hadn't checked it, but there was no sense in which the school had had to explain what they did and how they did it and whether they had role models or what they were trying to do to change uh, spaces for girls or things like that, you know, and so on. So there's an, an easy way in which over a period of time inspectors pay more carefully. And it's a strategic systemic change rather than just encouraging you know, and exhorting, don't want any more encouragement, don't want any more exhaustion. We want strategic programs practically implemented. Professor Hunter? Uh, just a, a very short point on the, the pace of change needed. What Ian's saying is absolutely true. Having new teachers who are better informed in mathematics is important, but it would take too long to enable that for, for the near future. And so CPD is probably the solution to that. Much more important when you're talking about early years, and it's already been mentioned, but I just want to emphasise it. Getting into the homes, getting into the communities, and uh, publicising that STEM is important for the future of our country is the important issue. Okay. Um, Dr McNeil, and I'll come to... The question of um, science qualifications for primary schools, the Learned Society Group has been pushing for it to be a requirement that primary school teachers um, should have at least one level five qualification in science. Um, we do accept that there, there's issues around recruitment, but we feel like that we maintaining standards is a sine qua non. That's really important, and we need to find flexible solutions to that. So, uh, well, one of the problems with STEM teachers, actually, is that they have to have higher English, which a lot of STEM students don't have. But our approach to that is not well, let's lower standards to make more teachers come in, but let's think about flexible solutions to this. So the Scottish Fundal Funding Council recommends that the education colleges accept students without higher English on the understanding that they can do it as their training, they can get it on the fly, there can be flexible solutions to this. Um, unfortunately, that's not really implemented very much at the moment, but I think there are flexible solutions to this. So we could accept primary school teachers who don't have any science qualifications and then help them gain those science qualifications as they train so that when they go into the schools, they have some kind of solid science foundation. Okay. Um, I, it's less, uh, is your question on this area, Ms. Dr. Allen? Are you? Well, it relates really to the question of qualifications in general and the number of people coming out of school with higher in science. Before then, okay. before we move on to that subject, and I suppose it's just worth pointing out that the Barcelona plus two, two language model um, actually forced a, a requirement for language, um, which is there, which um, I suppose set a, a, a little bit of a precedent in, in terms of the requirements for primary school teaching. Um, I'm going to Mr. Patterson. Um, <coughs> My daughter's just entered university, and my experience is that STEM is practically not on the agenda uh, with most parents, and I think so many parents, uh, in my experience, are the big influencers in the direction and the subjects that children take. I, so, I th and I do believe, you know, from again, from just paying attention to what was going on, I, it, that influence starts right at primary school. So that, and it's the point that, that Ross was making. For huge numbers, uh, they're just excluded from it. So uh, that's not to say that STEM's not a good thing. Uh, it's to say that the opportunities that present themselves to uh, parents and children, 
I don't think a lot of people understand what they are. So it's what, what we can do to influence the parents rather than the, the teachers and the schools, etc. I think it's, a, it's an enormous uh, barrier, but it's a great opportunity. So what can we do to, to inform parents what's available? Uh, Ms Jakob, you want to? Um, linked to that is also um, within the scope of whatever is investigated with this committee um, is the difference between affluent areas in Scotland and their access to STEM, uh, whether that is um, uh, role models from industry coming in, whether that is community-based um, learning. Um, we see more of that in affluent areas compared to socially deprived areas and rural communities in Scotland. If we're going to do something about this, it has to be Scotland-wide. It has to be a coherent strategy that's invested in across the board, um, not the lowest hanging fruit where there is already access to opportunity and investment. So it's just a, if there is um, investigation, particularly in early years in primary school, and then parents and community engagement, more of that is happening in affluent areas. So the, the emphasis needs to be, how do we do that in rural communities and areas of social deprivation? Does anyone else want to comment? Yeah, yeah, to say I agree that it's absolutely vital. I think some kind of public education campaign is, is really necessary. I, for example, I do a code club at my children's school and one of the parents came up to me and said, oh, my son's really enjoying this, but I don't want to encourage him too much because I feel there's not a lot of career opportunities. No, it's a very crowded market. And I was like... <laughs> That's crazy. There's enormous skills gap in this market. But it, and this was a very educated woman who just didn't was not aware of that. So I think really somehow spreading that message, not just among the parents, actually, that's really important, but also in the schools. I think a lot of the schools are not advising the, uh, the students as well as they might be about where the opportunities lie. Okay. Yeah, I see here. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of marries with the, the research that I did in industry when I did my, my postgrad and when I spoke to engineers about their career aspirations and inspirations, I can't remember the exact statistic, but an overwhelming majority of engineers, when I asked them why they chose engineering, there was some kind of family influence, whether it was somebody in the family who either was an engineer or valued engineering as a career choice. And it's all about building that STEM capital. And for a lot of people, they don't have any STEM capital. So I believe that the perceptions, you know, out in the media, exactly what you're saying, we need to raise that. And then within schools, you know, doing more of, I guess, what we've done in, in engaging, getting parents and learners together to, to tinker together, to um, realise where, you know, these skills we're, we're doing here, how does that apply to the real life and what, what are the opportunities outside so that, you know, when a, pay, when a child says they want to do engineering and then the parent says, well, that's a, that's a good career choice. Because I spoke to engineers who said that when they told that their parent they wanted to be an engineer, they, they tried to persuade them otherwise. Because for them and their family, it wasn't, they didn't value it as a career. And I think that's, that's where we, there's a, an incredibly um, biased perception of, of engineering out there. And it's ingrained in society and we need to, to work hard to, to kind of overcome that. Professor Wall. Yeah. Uh, just on that, we, what we need is a reprint of Neville Shute. Almost all his heroes were engineers. And, uh, and I mean, very successful in all sorts of ways, but that's by the by. Just on the picking up on, on Talat's point about um, um, schools in poorer areas, one of the things I'm involved in, I'm chair of SCDI, and we run the Young Engineers and Science Club. And I'm also on board of the Science Festival, and we run Generation Science, which takes, um, sees 50 to 60,000 uh, primary school children every year. But both of these things rely upon private sector funding, or, and some charity and trusts, and private sector funding. And teachers certainly find them extremely valuable. It is about having someone come in from the outside. And we are very careful about gender balance and, and the way we do things and all the rest of it. Um, so I mention that because I don't think it's uninteresting, but also that any discussion of these issues, whatever it might be as it moves around the table, needs to be set in the context of resources. I mean, it's not difficult to say, well, if we did this, you know, it would change things, and it would. The question is, do we get the right resources put in the right place to do it? Ms. Yeah. 
In two points. So, um, from what Ian said and Tally about um, equity, like um, a Scottish attainment in school in West Lothian, so we've got a high levels of deprivation, um, but we, we do really well with girls. But one barrier that we really face is um, there, there's all these amazing initiatives like the Cyber Security Christmas lectures and all that, but a lot of the time, sometimes we can't go because we don't we don't have the money like for buses, and that's just such a simple thing. And you don't want to ask the kids because they, they we know that they you know their backgrounds they don't they don't necessarily have the money either. And and, and that's just one simple thing that could easily be fixed if there was some sort of opportunity or budget that you know we could apply for because it's, it's just so difficult. Like I have to beg for money, but it, it works. But um, but it's really really hard, and it's definitely something that puts teachers off. And then from what Mr. Patterson was saying as well about trying to um, you know like raise aspirations of like get parents involved in things. One simple initiative that was used in Sky at Livingston recently, they'd done a parents' night and they brought the kids along and it was literally, they spoke to all the staff in Sky and it was fantastic and really well received. So again, two really simple things that might, might be able to help. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to Ms Smith. Thank you, Convener. I've just got two questions, both of clarification. First one to Dr McNeil. Is it the recommendation that, if at all possible, a primary school should have a dedicated science teacher? Um, because that was very much the recommendation. I think Ian Gray and I were at the conference uh, that the Royal Society of Chemistry made that um, policy recommendation five years ago. It, can I just be absolutely clear that is your recommendation? No, what the, what the LSG has been recommending is that all primary teachers have some science qualification. Not that any of them are, have particular skills in it, but they have at least a NAT5. So any, any primary teacher has a basic understanding. Um, it sounds like a great idea to have a, a science teacher in the primary school, but that's not something we've particularly discussed or pushed in the LSG. Okay. Um, my other question, um, Professor Wall, in your introduction, I think you said, but correct me if I'm wrong, that when you were writing your reports, there were various things that didn't make it into the report. Could you just clarify what these things were? I can't off the top of my head, but I could write a letter to the clerk explaining... It would just be interesting things. if any yeah. recommendations that weren't yeah. taken up, it would be helpful. The, um, yeah. Thank you. I mean... I mean, I could have, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I could have reeled it off, but it is about, it's two and a half or three years, so I'm just uh, slightly yeah, weak. No, I, I asked the question because this committee's yeah. been on STEM issues for uh, quite some time, and, you know, criticisms are made, and this is not a party political point at all, um, that all of us are responsible for not um, delivering on some of the uh, recommendations that have come out of previous um, studies, and I would just be interested to know if there were gaps as to what, what they were. I mean, my primary concern, I must say, was not that... I mean, we always took the view as a committee it was our job to make our recommendations as best as we thought fit, but it is government's responsibility and duty to determine these things, and we can get obsessed with education, but there are health issues, you know, there are transport issues and so on. Government has to make judgments. Uh, but what did irritate us was that our report was carefully, you know, had something like 50 or 60 detailed recommendations, and past this approach by most governments of any colour has been, and in fact was on the first SEAG report, was to then respond to them. Yes, we agree with this and we'll do that. This is a good idea, but it's too early. You know, no, we disagree with this. You know, it's that, you know, nobody's perfect. It was that failure to engage and then just pick out the things that they put into the strategy that, that made us angry. We didn't expect everything we suggested. And, and some of them are, are not... Uh, not entirely agreed by everybody. I mean, the discussion about a science specialist in a primary school, we were not that keen on it. We could see its merits, but our worry was then it just becomes a little silo. Oh, well, we don't have to do science because, you know, Mrs. Joseph will do the science and we, we don't have to bother anymore. So, you know, it, um, but never anyway. Sorry, Jim. Thank you. The, both practitioners have both mentioned clusters in the primary school cluster programme. Um, that's not universal throughout Scotland. Um, not everyone signs up to that. So c could you just tell us what that means to you? What, what, what added value that gives? So just in terms of the, you know, the, the cluster is just your cluster of primary schools that are feeding into, to, into a, a secondary school. So what, I think my point was that you know, we are, um, at our school, we've had a big push on STEM. Um, and we're doing a lot of positive things and other people have said what we're doing is very positive but we're on a journey and we need to embed this into into the school um, you know and I'm involved in another group that's looking um, for Fife as, as how we can kind of bring you know different schools together 
to share best practice um, because, as I say, there's these pockets of, of what's going on and, and that's the best way for, for teachers to, to do that. But the issue, again, and we were talking about this before we came in, Tony and I, is time. Time is a huge issue for teachers and workload is a huge... I mean, that, that's a whole different issue. We've had the whole pay campaign and I know that that's still ongoing um, and workload, you know, as part of that agreement, we've been told that will be addressed and it needs to be addressed because... To me, that you know, the, even in the, these sharing events, you know, it's scheduling the time for those, it's the preparation for those. You know, we had a, a big STEM showcase at our school, and all the staff are, are you know, preparing for this. In addition to yeah. the the you know, keeping a classroom running with all your subjects, your literacy, your gym, your science, your army, the whole lot, and um, I think that's a massive. A massive barrier that perhaps we, you know, we need to look at how can we give teachers the the flexibility and time, you know, to to lead on these things and disseminate, you know, those skills and the strengths amongst the clusters because it's so all well and good that you know we're putting this as our school. This is on you know, um, gender gender bias and STEM is on our school quality improvement plan. Every school has a has a squip, and that has been prioritised. Um, and for our cluster, you know, that, that's a priority. So we're kind of all working together for the same means. But we need to make sure that all across Scotland, all schools are prioritising these issues on their squips and that all schools within that cluster, because if one or two primary schools are doing very good things, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that we're, everything we do is great, but we've had success in some areas and there's other schools that are doing amazing things as well, but we need all the schools, so by the time they come into high school, to, to Tony, there's there's not a big discrepancy in terms of the, the skills and the um, the knowledge that the learners are showing. I mean, I don't know what you, what you think. Yeah, um, I know with my school, we, again, we've got like the primary cluster um, who are like feeder primary schools who all come to our secondary and then we've got um, of course secondary schools so there's 11 secondary schools in West Lothian um, as like computing we we have very little actually none <laughs> we have no communication with primary schools when it comes to computing um, but I know there is work done with English and maths um, and then even with secondary schools like Lorna was saying um, we get one designated day I think like a year um, with a, a, a specific set of um, secondary schools who are close to us but they're not net, like they do totally different things and there's no wriggle room or flexibility to say actually we 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 do similar things to this school so we'd quite like to go over there um there's none of it like they encourage it they want you to do it but there is no time to do it apart from one day that you are forced to work with people and bring things along and like you had says it's like a it's just a, a one-off. It's not like a ongoing thing where you can really build up um, and work together. I actually find it easier. Like we've we were talking about this earlier. Like there's so much bureaucracy in schools, and it's so difficult to get anything off the ground that I genuinely think it's easier to make waves across the whole of Scotland. And so um, social media and you know that like like my little um, charity that I've got going, um, like little cyber um, security competitions and things. It's so much easier to make waves across the whole of Scotland as opposed to my school, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, so I can't I can't give you an answer, but I think just teachers need to um, be brave and just just do it instead of, you know, use social media instead of going through um, the, maybe the official protocols because it's, it's so hard. <laughs> Professor Hunter. Kavira, I don't, I don't know if the, if the point of your question was, was also about the maturation of the cluster programme. In various geographic locations throughout our country, it's more mature than others. Our two practitioners are obviously in locations where it's very mature, but in some locations it's hardly started. And so that's important to note and to try and accelerate the adoption. And in that context, there's also, of, of recent, uh, the recent year, the formation of the regional improvement collaboratives, so-called RICs, um, and they sit at a very high level in, in this infrastructure. And, and RICs seem to be, um, uh, I've been, well, not allowed as it's pejorative, but, but they're certainly um, given largesse to create their own agendas, their own priorities, their own regional uh, issues. And it, it saddens me sometimes to see the lack of STEM issues in some of the script that's now being written by some RICs. Hey, Professor Wall. 
On the question of clusters, I mean, they're absolutely vital. It's, I mean, they cover so many things. It's about transition from primary to second, the point was touched upon. It's about engaging, again, uh, talk about specialist teachers. There are specialist teachers in secondary schools. They're in your cluster. You know, if you want to get a bit of, you know, s a strong support from a, a, a chemistry teacher, a physics teacher, a maths teacher, it's there if there's a functioning cluster that works really well. Uh, SSERC has a programme where it does work with uh, secondary schools and their clusters to develop their science, because it's a science initiative that um, it's funded by the government, but it's very slow. They're doing a number of local authorities each year, and then it's done once and left, and it needs to be sustained. I couldn't underestimate the power of clusters, but it does lead on to a question that's been raised by a number of the people speaking today about the question of time in schools. And one of the areas uh, that was ignored in our report was our point about time in, in schools. And a lot of the things we talk about require quality time by teachers to engage, whether you're creating IDL or you're doing proper cluster work and things like that. You know, to have a cluster meeting of secondary school teachers and primary school teachers takes half a day. You know, and that's quite a lot out of school time. And there is, all schools now are running on incredibly tight um, you know, I mean, you're fortunate to have active teachers here because if one teacher goes ill, no one leaves the school. I mean, it, it really is uh, quite disastrous now. But at the same time, we do have a culture of overwork in schools. You know, there's an obsession as long as a pupil is sitting in front of a teacher, she must be doing okay. And that's just not true, and all the evidence shows that. So in our report, there was a, quite a section dealing with different... Well, no, there are no magic bullets, but if you accept that as the problem and then you start working on a number of different things, one is to reduce uh, contact time. Actually, I mean, there's a very... I mean, you've all heard of Passy Salberg, I mean, you know, but one of his dictums is um, teach less, learn more, uh, you know, and things like that. And there, there are a whole range of issues around there which we tried to unpack in the report and said this is the way to go forward because if you release time, then a lot of the things that are talked about become much easier to achieve. Dr Allen. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to open up the whole debate, or whole discussion rather, about um, subject choice because the committee is going to do a piece of work on that in itself. But just to pick up on a, an issue that um, Dr McNeil raised right at the beginning um, about the number of young people coming out of school with STEM qualifications. Um, you mentioned that STEM amongst the increasing number of hires seems to, be, seems to have declined. My understanding was that higher maths, there are more young people coming out of school than before with higher maths. So is this, firstly, is this more localised, as I suspect it is, to some specific science subjects? And also, I, su I suppose related to that is, what can we do in the first three years, the broad general education uh, of secondary, to ensure that people feel they have a strong enough grounding to take up science subjects in fifth and sixth year? Uh, well, I, I'm afraid I don't have the figures in front of me. I can find the figures for which are going up and which are going down. Um, certainly, it does affect some STEM, some STEM subjects more than others, and it's always the case, computing is probably the worst. Um, it's certainly going down quite alarmingly in computing. Um, other STEM subjects are maybe a little bit more stable. So looking into the details, I agree that's really important, and I can um, find, the, uh, find the data and send that around if that's useful. Um, in terms of what we can do to enthuse them, I think if you're, if, you're, if you're forcing them at the end of S3 or even in some schools at the end of S2 to choose six subjects, I think, however, it's, it's always difficult to... It's always going to squeeze out subjects that are not the core subjects they've been studying all the way through. I think um, the more ingrained STEM is in, in the broad general education phase, not just in... in, in S1 to S3, but also in primary school, the more they're getting STEM, the more they're seeing that STEM is something they understand, something that leads to things they find interesting, the more likely they are to take STEM qualifications later on. So just strengthening STEM education the whole way through, I think, is, is really important. Ms. Turner? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, that the pr we've, we're all sort of in agreement about strengthening STEM throughout education, but for me, the focus needs to be at primary school level. Um, my daughter's school, for example, they now pick their subjects at the end of first year. So I feel that if you're not engaging them with the science in the primary school, they're just not going to pick those subjects by the time they get to secondary school. And I wanted to pick up on a point that Tony made earlier about lift and use resources. Um, again, I'm not advocating. There are lots of great resources out there for teachers. It's back to time. It's about back to confidence. But if we look specifically at the barefoot, um, resources which are now being used in about 69% of primary schools in some shape or fashion. It's all about um, 
helping teachers build the confidence if they don't already have that to teach computational thinking and this also picks up on the point about how do we engage parents it's about not necessarily talking to a seven-year-old or their parents about um, a career in computing science it's about talking to them about the importance of computational thinking across all the subjects and teachers want those resources that they can use across the curriculum so there's something about not treating things in silos and looking at them as this across curricular way and it strikes me that if those resources those lift and use resources that are you know match the scottish curriculum don't exist for secondary schools then that's something we should look to explore develop miss kelly Add on to Alistair's point, um, in my school they pick in second year, um, and, but then what happens is you have to drop. So if you decide not to pick any STEM subjects, you're not allowed to pick it up. Like it's, it's just you, you just keep dropping, and it's just it's just bizarre. Like you you don't know what you want to be when you're you're 12. A lot of time you, it changes, and and if that like the subject choice does not include the flexibility to pick up something new. Um, that, that, that you've, you've just halted it right there and then, and it's, it's just it's really unfortunate. Um, but yeah, just wait to chip in there. Um, Mr. Gray, would you? Um, I had two questions, which kind of track back to two different strands. So if that's if that's okay, um, one is um, well, I suppose for Tony uh, and Fiona maybe as well. So we talked a bit about um, poor understanding of career opportunities in engineering or computer science and coding. But isn't there a problem which is the opposite of that, which is that one of the reasons we can't recruit computer science teachers is frankly they can get paid a lot more if they work in, in industry. And how how on earth do we do we do we deal with that? So that that was one question. The other was I suppose really for um the the two Ians um to Professor Ian's. The, uh, in your introduction, um, Ian, you said the STEM report, well, two things. In, in the um, submission you made, you, you made the point that we've been here before in 2003, in 2012, and again in 2016. And then you say that while you wouldn't say the strategy is not being implemented, it's not, you would say it's not being implemented with the urgency and vigour required. I think was 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 what you said, and I just wondered if you could enlarge on that. And I wondered if Ian had a view on that as well, because you're involved in the implementation group, yeah, as yeah. as you pointed out, um, how you, whether you felt that was true or what the difficulties were in actually taking it forward. McNeil, on the first question. Yeah. Well, that's I mean that's undoubtedly a huge issue that we don't have enough computing graduates at all. So industry is desperate for them. Industry pays them very well. Industry is quite aggressive at attracting them, um, and so there's just not enough students to go around and teaching loses out for sure. I mean the solution to that is to get infuse young people to study computing more and get more teachers into schools so that more people are coming through doing computing. Industry. Hmm? So that salaries get pushed down in the industry. Yeah, so actually the salary question is very interesting. We had a, um, Judy Robertson at Murray House School of Education has been doing some really interesting research around salaries. The salary difference between uh, coding, computing industry and teaching, and it's not nearly as big as you would think. So there are people in the tech industry making huge amounts of money, but most people are making a little bit more than teachers, but not at this, not a huge difference. And I think the students don't understand that. And also perhaps they all see themselves as, as being the ones who are gonna get the star job at Rockstar North or whatever. Um, so, but I think that promoting teaching as a, as a really rewarding career and a career that is that it has a decent salary, it's not a poor salary, it's not amazingly high, but it's decent. Um, promotion is really important there. Um, and also, as I was saying, this flexible entry requirement, I've had, in the last four years, I've had three of my best really excellent students who really want to go into teaching none of them had higher english all of the all of the education institutes they applied to said absolutely not you have to take higher english before we'll even consider consider you which means taking a year out they can't afford to do that lost to the teaching industry so flexible approaches without lowering standards but flexible approaches are really important but promotion of teaching the in industry comes into universities and it grabs the students and it sells itself it gives them all kinds of freebies and and it's really visible and, and teaching is just not visible and it really needs to be i think that's really important 
Oh, sorry. Um, to build on Fiona's point as well, um, I think it's just to show kids, is, and, and again, get, get them in early at high school and things, encourage them, show them what's out there, because I think a lot of people just think computing is just being a programmer, you know, like being a software developer and you're just sitting by yourself and it just isn't, that there's so much out there. So like I've got a little part of dress code, I'm doing a Choose Computing Science campaign that I'm going to roll out across the country um, and just to try and raise awareness to teachers as well that, you know, big up the jobs, like you can be a designer if you're really creative, like they will pay massive amounts of money for that, but then also like try and keep them in the classroom, but, like, but you could be like me, <laughs> um, you know, you, you could also help and try and get them um, in, but I think it's to try and show all the, the jobs that are out there as well. Oh, uh, Oliver, do you want a small supplementary? Sort of, mm -hmm. uh, convener on this, this topic. I just wonder whether, and we've obviously only got uh, sort of one representative of industry as such here, but whether there's more industry can do. Uh, and you know, I, I worry because for, for even for Rockstar or for other people, there comes an eventual point where if you're taking everyone out of the teaching pool and not helping bring those new schools, skills through, surely as a business, you kind of get to a point where you have quite a big problem in that there's no one to, to you know, there's no one to fulfil your needs, and it's whether there's a link up between teaching shortage and businesses, and whether there's more industry can be doing. First two points first, and then we'll come to that one if that's okay. So okay. if I can bring Professor Wall in first. Yeah. I mean the point you make about the number of reports that have been uh, is partly an answer to Ian's earlier comment about, well, if we did something about improving the, uh, the standards of teachers starting teacher, it would take a long time to fix. But actually, if we'd started in 2003, we'd have had 16 years worth of fixing already and so on. So I think there is a there is a, a, a problem, I think, that we've not touched on so far. It's about the administration of education. I mean, Ian did refer to RICS and so on. Uh, now, whatever their merits or strengths, um, it is an administrative restructuring rather than addressing an education issue. And it is the case that if you look at local authorities, they've lost their QIOs. Well, actually, I'm old enough to remember when local authorities had um, subject specialists. And then they became QIOs, and the number of them reduces. The number of school teachers continues to reduce proportionately, and so on. Um, the, the RICs maybe uh, have uh, some money, but I suspect compared with what local authorities used to spend on these issues 20 years ago, it's really a small pot in the ocean. The role of Education Scotland, the inspectorate and things like that, these are quite critical to the success of education, and if they're motoring in the right way, and often a lot of what is done by all politicians and the civil servants who respond to them is really, really short term. I'm not talking, I mean, it, you know, one minor change in a figure is either a triumph beyond parallel or it's a disaster in which Scottish education is going to the dogs, you know. I mean, it's just, and if you look at the, and I mean, all of the politicians of all parties play this game. And it's a game because it's meaningless and actually it's counterproductive to what we're all trying to do. And if you look at the, the, current administration's report on their STEM strategy for this year, it's a really poor piece of work. I mean, if it was submitted as an essay to a school teacher, you know, or a report on, on, a, on, a, on a, a project, that, uh, which is what it is, it's a project that has been established by the government to be carried through with lots of good stuff in it, actually it would get, I don't know, C minus, if you're lucky, a D plus. No, I think it'd be a fail, actually. I mean, just look at the figures in them, you know? I mean, the figure, it's, it's a piece of flim-flam. And it should be about a quarter of its length if you take out all the visuals and meaningless stuff and all the rest of it. And it, it's symptomatic of a problem that is not true of this. It's not, a, you know, it's not one party's problem. It's actually, it's across the piece. And in some respects, we're being let down because there are good recommendations, there's good work, you have good officers, but actually it's, you know, beck and call and, very sh and a shortage of the resources needed strategically to say with confidence, right, we're going to be doing this for the next five years and we don't expect answers in year one or even in year three, except we're beginning to see a glimmer of hope in year three and by five we're actually beginning to motor. And, um, improving an education system is a long-term strategy and that's why reports such as we are, but others have done tapping our transfers, are really valuable to society. But what is more valuable is an administration with a small A and a big A that puts them into place in a professional manner. Thank you. Professor Hunter. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about the resource that Scottish Government deploys on this. Um, 
when I got into this, it was also, as I, as I mentioned, as, as, a, as a professional scientist, all of us have been signed up to STEM, all of us have been doing outreach for, for me a number of decades now, and what impact w was this having? Um, the, we've been talking over the last 15 years. So are we making a difference? That's, that's the big question. And, and Mr. Gray asked me to comment specifically on what's happening right now. I'm just going to hold up two pieces of paper. Talat was actually on the group that, that we looked to advise on the policy. This is data sets where we actually, they're not perfect. They will never be perfect. They were, this is the May 2017, and then we upgrade it now to the turn of last year. Are we making a difference? And, and the report that you refer to is trying to capture that. If I were to be honest, a lot of the changes that are reported in the first report of the STEM strategy, which came out in February, were actually already in process before this action took place. But it's important to look annually at this to see that progress is being made or where it's not being made to address that rather than come back in five years' time and say it didn't happen in the same way that you were uh, on your initial submission saying we did this five years ago and not a lot has happened. I think it's important to also emphasise that the, the current five-year strategy actually uh, bridges into the next Scottish Government because there will be an election before the end of that five-year period and I think it would be important to take stock four years into it, which is when the cycle for re-election of MSPs comes up to see what has happened. Okay, um, if you can return to Oliver's point, which is about the industry engagement, and um, Ms. Jacob, you, earlier on you talked about whole Scotland strategies and about inequality for rural areas, and um, I, I, I think it's, um, we had the example of Sky coming into to, um, the West Lothian, and I do have a concern that industry engagement if, if you're talking about rural areas, deindustrialised areas, if they don't have the, the sort of high tech and um, high end engineering companies there, are, are, are people missing out? So, um, so just a little addition say, sorry, to that. Con so. Convener, my, my yeah. question was more what industry is doing to help encourage people into teaching oh, right. rather, sorry. rather, uh -huh. rather mm -hmm. than concentrating on their immediate recruitment Indeed. needs. Okay, I misunderstood uh, because, that. Sorry. Because I worry. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I worry, I mean, obviously the government set up a scheme to help encourage teachers to retrain, or people in industry to retrain into teaching, uh, but I think certainly I've, I have a perception that the that, that industry is a bit reluctant to let people go, and at that graduate recruitment level, they're more interested in getting the available people now than letting or encouraging some of those people to go back into teaching. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood that. So, uh, and Oliver's point about teaching, Ms. Turner, did you want yeah, to Yeah, I'm that not really sure I can, you know, speak conclusively about the industry. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that we do anything to encourage people into teaching. It's something I'd certainly happily take back and discuss with colleagues. That I'm not aware that we do anything proactively in terms of bursaries or, or that type of thing, or if that's what you were meaning, Oliver, sorry. Um, what I would say, coming back to the point about the rural is I think that's a really genuine point because you know a lot of the um, IT and communication big companies are perhaps central belted etc although to be honest with technology and flexible working or home working you know an organization like us we have we have people all over uh, the country and so for example we have people who go out and volunteer to run free workshops for barefoot they're happening everywhere around Scotland and to address the rural issue where we had um, requests from primary schools, perhaps in very, very remote islands, etc. They're now running those workshops, streaming them online for them. It's not the perfect solution, but it is, you know, about using the technology in the best way and making sure that those rural areas are not missing out um, on that. And everything that we provide around Barefoot is, is free and it's downloadable, so they don't have to come to a central location to, to have that training, perhaps in the way that they do with CPD training etc. We also work a lot with partners, we talked about young engineers and science clubs so we've also trained people um, in those teams who now deliver Barefoot as an example as part of the CPD training offering to teachers and again that means that they're out and about in rural as well as urban areas. So we do, we're very conscious of that, you know, how do we find ways around that problem? 
Ms. Jacob, you want to pick up? Um, on the point about industry, the issue, of course, is that there is an immediate need. There's an immediate skill shortage across STEM. So industry is naturally going to be looking to fill those posts. So according to SDS, there's 12,800 digital technology opportunities every year. Uh, according to um, Engineering UK, across the UK, there's a need for 185,000 more engineers over the next five years. So it is natural that industry isn't going to be pushing them down the teaching route. So it's really for government local authorities to do that push to do that that to make visible why teaching is valuable as well and to have as Fiona said that kind of public engagement um, but one of the things I'm very aware of is that in this conversation we have talked rightly about early years and primary education but the skill shortage within STEM is, is, is now and um, so I think it's also important that um, it's noted that according to tapping all our talents only 30 percent of women who um, graduate with a qualification in STEM, stay in STEM related jobs long term. We've got to do something about, about that particular pipeline, otherwise we're not, the, the issue is here and now as well as in five years time. And, and one of the things that, uh, for, certainly from Equate Scotland's point of view, in the research we've done, the more industry engagement that women have whilst they are qualifying, whether that's in college or university, the higher the likelihood of them staying longer term in the industry because they know what the industry is actually about. So our career-wise uh, summer placements, which is the only paid placement opportunities for women in STEM in the whole of Scotland, sees where there's 30% on average staying in the sector, there's almost 60% staying in the sector when they go through our um, placements. So it's, oh, that, that's something that works. That's something that we're all very aware of needs to be expanded. We need to get more industry partners to participate in it. It's only been going for six years, but we've seen those who came into the first two years are almost twice as likely to stay in the industry long term. So there is things we can do within further and higher education with industry to do something about the skill shortage now. Miss Hay, you wanted to come back? Yeah, just, can I absolutely agree with you, Ted, that, you know, I'm coming at this from an early years perspective, but I know that what I'm doing now isn't going to be seen for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely, it needs to be addressed on, a, on an immediate level. Um, I can't comment about teachers, you know, um, being encouraged from industry, but I wanted to come back to the point um, about those relationships, what is industry doing now to, to engage with schools and coming back to the research um, in learning to be an engineer by Bill Lucas, um, one of the signature pedagogies that they put forward for the teaching engine of engineering was authentic learning with engineers. Um, and I've seen um, you know, the benefit of that in, in my own setting. We've had over, you know, last month we had 16 engineers come into school access through the STEM, STEM ambassador network, which by mm. the way is doing fantastic things, but perhaps we need to look at increasing their funding to um, to do more, um, and you know, there's there's two benefits of that in, in my mind. Firstly, it's creating again coming back to these role models, and young people are are seeing these engineers. They're discussing their ideas for inventions with real engineers. It's in a real context, um, and as a result of that, a lot of young people in the school are vocalising that they want to be an engineer. I, I know what they're saying now. They might not necessarily do it later. But, and, but they're not just an engineer. You know, one girl said to me, oh, I'm going to be a civil engineer. And another one said, actually, I want to be an aeronautical engineer. So there's, there's that aspect, but also coming back to the teacher confidence. When I started working alongside an engineer, building these cars or having the children in, invent these solutions to problems they come up with, I got a huge amount of confidence from working alongside a, a real engineer. But that there are you have the STEM ambassador network, which is which is doing very well, and I believe that the numbers are increasing. But there's also a lot of barriers for companies to actually financially don't have the money to release people to come in um, and work with schools. I was lucky; my husband's a software engineer, um, and I wanted him to come in to speak to children, and he had to do that on um, on on one of his days off because just there just wasn't the money to to release him to do that. So perhaps looking more at funding for companies to actually do, you know, the engagement like what you were saying you were doing, Liz. So um, I just want to say that I think it's important to, to do that for the teacher's confidence and their CPD, but also in terms of learning and engagement. I, I'm, I'm really conscious, I've still got Ms. Goldruth and Ms. Anand. We literally have two minutes left because uh, 
Miss Gillian's got a higher class to get to and their exams in, I think, nine days. So um, we don't want to delay it. So very, very quick contributions from you both, if that's okay, Miss Gildreth. Yeah, very quickly, obviously, schools can only do so much. So we, we've looked today, uh, we focus quite a lot on school education. But in terms of the industry point, I want to go back to that and ask about if there's still a cultural resistance, perhaps, Liz, you might be able to answer that with regard to stereotypes in industry. Because I know in Glenrothes, you won't like to hear this, Lorna, but I, heard, I met the MD of a local company pretty recently, um, who, when I said to him, he brought a number of his employees with him, they were all male, where are the women? He said, well, we don't have any, and um, we can't get them, and obviously it's the best person for the job. Now, mm -hmm. I was quite taken aback by that, um, because he did not recognise that he had a corporate or social responsibility to do more as an employer. So I just wanted to ask about those stereotypes and whether or not you, you think they pervade in industry. Um, I don't. I don't think they do pervade in in IT and communications. I don't think they do. I think there's a genuine desire that industry wants more women um, in, and we recognise that the, the contribution they bring, etc. So I, I don't think that is pervading. I think what we're seeing is there's lots of initiatives we're trying to support through our corporate responsibility. I also wanted to mention volunteering and perhaps, perhaps in terms of business engagement, that's the route to go down. But I think most of the big companies are are genuinely doing that. We give people three days a year to go out and volunteer. Some of them will be going out and supporting initiatives like Barefoot, some of them will be going out and doing other things. But tapping into that um, is important. But there are a lot of calls on industry to support lots of things, whether it be developing the young workforce, individual schools wanting you to come in. The sheer volume of requests coming in on a weekly basis um, means that it's much simpler and um, better quality for us to provide things that anyone can access. So whether that's free downloadable resources, et cetera. Um, I, just to finalise, I, no, I think there is a genuine desire that people recognise they need um, to support initiatives, whether that be smart stems or where it happens to be um, programmes that are encouraging women into, um, into the industry, definitely. Yeah. Very final two contributions, unfortunately. Um, Ms Jakob and then Dr McNeil. Um, so, not to contradict that entirely, but the reality, of course, is that I think there is a lot of goodwill to work with schools and do things with girls. I think there's a difference in recruiting women and, there's an, uh, and retaining women. They're, all the women that we work with will describe the fact that they experience sexism, that they experience unconscious bias, that whilst there is goodwill, there is significant amounts that industry needs to do. And what we tend to find is that um, if you look at sea level of a, of a company, or you look at the management level, or you look at the equality and diversity strategy, all the right things are there. But culture within, and particularly middle management, there needs to be a significant amount of equality and diversity training, learning, knowledge, so that there is culture change. So I think there is a, a difference between supporting the agenda, um, pursuing the agenda with schools, and then pursuing the agenda by taking positive action measures, for example, when it comes to women. That, that bit is not there, which doesn't surprise me that you would come across that attitude. Whilst industry is very supportive, I also I uh, think that that is also still prevalent. Almost the same. I think there's been great strides in the industry. That's great. Um, I would say particularly in the tech industry, there's still huge areas of the tech industry that are absolutely toxic for women. And, it's, and sometimes I'm hesitant to encourage girls to go into the tech industry because in some areas it's just really hard. So the good work's being done. We really need to continue that. That problem is not solved. Okay, I think I'm going to have to... Um, call things to an end today. Thank you everyone who's um, taken part this morning. It's been really, really helpful. Um, the committee is going to, to, to do its inquiry um, uh, shortly um, later in the year and um, I'm sure there'll be many more opportunities to engage and if you feel there's anything that you haven't been able to say today that you'd like to, to give us, we'd be, be delighted to hear from you again. So thank you very much. I'm going to suspend for five minutes. Thank you.